Hi everybody, welcome to the December 4th, 2015 edition of Colorado Inside Out. I'm your host, Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you very much for joining us. With such a big news week, let's get right into the show. With three mass shootings happening across the United States in the last week, national leaders are addressing many of the angles of the events. While President Obama spoke about ensuring these incidents do not become the norm, House Speaker Paul Ryan called for the need to address mental health issues. Pat Cahoon from Westward, it, it, it's even hard to try to put any sort of uh, boundaries on all the different things that have happened this week. But look, starting with the bigger picture, what do you think? Well, I'm going to start small and go to the bigger <laughs> picture. Because it's amazing, last week when we normally would have been doing this show, mm -hmm. the, we're just beginning to hear about the shootings in Colorado Springs, which we'll talk about more. But you just can't believe it's happening here again. And then, then of course, the bigger picture. It's happening everywhere, and there always are different twists, so no matter what fix you come up with, it wouldn't necessarily affect the next thing coming down. So yeah, mental health is great. I'm all for Congress saying, let's really do something about mental health. But we spent $30 million in Colorado last year in response to the theater shootings, that was gonna help, and it certainly didn't stop what happened in Colorado Springs. We're gonna hear about guns too, but we also hear even if there were more gun legislation, it wouldn't have stopped what happened in California because those guns were purchased legally. If, uh, and then you go to France. I mean, I know everyone is fact-checking everyone else that Obama said, you know, it only happens here. Well, obviously, what happened in France was not happening in this country. It happens everywhere, and it's happening in all corners. And all you can do is try to come up with little fixes in every single area because nothing is going to be the one solution that will stop it. Mm -hmm. You can't, the, what's going on in San Bernardino is beyond belief because it's workplace violence, it's fundamentalism, it's hard to really tell how that's going to shake out. Mm -hmm. David Copel from the Independence Institute and DU Law School, uh, I've already read some of your work this week that uh, you've done for, I believe it's the Washington Post, uh, and I know you've been called by a, a variety of media sources, you're one of the top Second Amendment experts in the country, but beyond just the Second Amendment, we have a lot of different angles here, whether it's uh, abortion rights, uh, gun control, we have terrorism issues, there's, there's immigration stuff, it's, it's all over the map. Starting again from, from the, uh, the larger picture, what are some of your takeaways? I think the, the mental health strengthening that safety net is not a 100% solution for everything, but we know that it can make a big difference. Put as sensational crimes get media attention, but the situations where there's just a, a guy who's mentally ill kills one or two people, you know, that, that's never news beyond the town where it takes place. About one-fifth of the people in state prisons today for homicide have serious mental illness problems. When you go to the extreme end, even beyond homicide, up, up to the, the mass attacks, it's a much higher percentage than that. And we also know that there is, I, I hear it anecdotally from people who write to me, and you know, uh, so many people go to a mental health facility and say, I know I'm going downhill, I need help, I, can you check me in? And they get told, no, you're not sick enough yet. And relatives call and say, this, this person's really deteriorating, can, can somebody help? And the answer is no, there's no help. Uh, but if they commit a crime, then we can put them in, in prison or jail. And so we've essentially moved, changed, we've reinstitutionalized people who should be getting help in mental hospitals, and now they're the Los Angeles County Jail is the largest mental health facility in this country right now in terms of how many people it has. And helping mentally ill people voluntarily, just giving them the treatment they're asking for, the most important crime reductive effect will be reducing crimes against them. They are victimized at a much higher rate. So that is something constructive we ought to do. And of all the things government spends money on, Quentin Tarantino movies, things like that. We ought to repurpose that to the legitimate thing of a much stronger safety net to help the mentally ill. Eric Sondman, political analyst. Uh, we're gonna talk about the local political ramifications in our next round, but in this round, 
It seems to me that this is going to, uh, it, it can't help but become a major issue for the presidential campaign, but it's going to be multi-pronged. And like I said, there's a lot of different issues with it, especially I think within a Republican primary. Uh, do you think this grows arms and legs issue-wise politically? Oh, of course it does. And yes, it is within a Republican primary, but it's also within a general. Democrats who have been afraid of the gun control issue ever since a lot of Democratic strategists regarded as having cost Al Gore the 2000 election, cost in West Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, other states like that, any one of which had he won, Florida would have been a moot point. So Democrats have shied away from this issue, but there's no more shying away from it. The Democrats are embracing this issue. David is right, but he's only half right. I mean, I guess what bothers me about this issue is whenever we have an incident like this, and obviously we've had more than one in this last week, everyone goes running to their corners. And gun control advocates, the left in this country, led by the president, immediately, you know, before the bodies have even been dealt with. Are, are singing gun control music and and gun rights activists are talking about mental health and for some reason color me whatever you want to color me I don't regard those as mutually exclusive I mean I think you can have a serious conversation about both and you can seriously deal with both now guns are not going to vanish from this country we have it's part of the American culture, not to mention part of our Constitution. But that doesn't mean they can't be regulated in a more substantial way than they are currently regulated. I think what bothers me, scares me the most right now, is to the extent that we're really developing a culture of fear uh, and how this is the narrative of this time in America and this time around the world. And it's a narrative for a lot of reasons. And, and, and uh, we live in a very serious world. But as soon as we're done taping this show, I'm going to go out to a local K-8 school, do a workshop out there. And as I think about it, I am at much more risk driving from here to that school on the roads of Denver than I am sitting in that school for 90 minutes running a workshop. I think we have to have some perspective yeah. of, yes, these incidents happen way, way, way too often, but we don't need to live in the kind of fear that I think is promoted by the media and promoted by mass culture. Mm -hmm. Multimedia journalist Lisa Kennedy joins us the first time. Thank you very much for uh, being here. I know sometimes when we have a, a major event in the United States in history, it can unify the population. So even if people are on the right or left on an issue, something like 9-11, uh, like Pearl Harbor, things like that where people say, okay, the, we can compromise now. This doesn't seem to be one of those things, even though it's a really big event, you see people, like uh, Eric had said, going to their corners more fervently, not looking for compromise, but maybe there's that independent voter out in America that wants to see some compromise. Out of all these big issues and different angles, what's your take? Yeah, well, I think that um, that's such a great point because I th just time-wise, it seems f more and more frequently we don't have that moment. It's just like we don't even have that sliver of like pause before we're like back in the corners. And I think it's not just independent voters. I think that people that feel themselves to be either centrist or moderate on, on either side of the aisle find this sort of um, rush back to the ideological positions, not only exhausting, um, cynical, and in weird, weird ways sort of dangerous for what we stand for as a nation. And, I, so, and, and that's sort of from, a, and, you know, to some degree, I feel like the outlier here, because it's like, you guys are all like really political. And I'm the culture person who sort of, got, you know, my back got up a little bit about the Quentin Tarantino thing. So, you know, it's like, it's like, hmm. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. Um, but I think that Patty, I mean, everyone's kind of, for me, this, the notion that we have to problem solve a lot of places at a lot, I mean, this is the, I think that's the struggle, right? I mean, this is, this is a sidebar, which is saw Spike Lee's Chirac, right? And it's Chicago and Iraq, the, and it's about gun violence. And I can tell that because he's trying to straddle both the gun violence issue and the black on black crime issue, that he's gonna get hammered from all, all people, including people from, you know, the quote unquote black community, because no one wants to sort of say that there's something that looks, looks like black on black crime. And I, and, and I think that it's like, it's crime, but it's in a neighborhood that sees itself as a community. And therefore, that's why you have a phrase like that. Mm -hmm. But as what you said, I think, is just like nationally, um, we're missing some opportunity. If you ask me, you know, I don't have like a disgrace thing later, um, but part of what's a disgrace is like how quickly we forget loss mm -hmm. and how quickly we forget that these are like conversations um, 
that are about grief as well. And I don't know why, you know, I'm afraid of flying. So that notion that like I'm much more likely to die on the road than I am in an airplane. I know that rationally, the same way I know rationally I'm going to go to the movie theater, though I'm a little bit more anxious than I used to be. Um, but at the same time, I think we have to take seriously how fear works for people, mm -hmm. what it is, and what it sort of, and help them understand what it is, and not just sort of discount it as irrational. Right. So much as going, there's things to be afraid of, and if we're not afraid here, then we're going to be really afraid down here when we don't know why this thing happened. It's like, do you know what I mean in a way? Yeah, so that makes sense. Locally, the attack at the Colorado Springs Planned Parenthood facility has Colorado leaders pointing fingers. Republican State Representative Joanne Winholtz used social media to blame Pan Planned Parenthood for instigating the violence. Meanwhile, Democrat Representative Diana DeGette cited the GOP's continued anti-Planned Parenthood rhetoric as a cause for the incident. Uh, David, I, I knew as soon as we had even just a scant little bit of details from the incident last Friday that it was going to get political quickly. I was still astonished how fast um, and how quickly it got ramped up. To, I mean, it's that old Spinal Tap thing. We were able to turn it to 11 very quickly uh, in this town. And I, I guess, were you surprised? And what do you think of the fallout so far? Well, very depressing all around in terms mm -hmm. of the discussion we've been having about everybody just wants to go in one corner or another and, and, and scream at each other. Let's talk about somebody who was really responsible in the media. When the attack was happening, Kyle Clark, in his Twitter feed, was calling out irresponsible mm -hmm. media down there who were listening to scanner traffic and tweeting out things like the tactical positions of where police officers were. You know, well, of course, and the, the criminal, for all anybody knew, had a cell phone with a scanner app on it. So because he did that, they stopped doing that. So that's kudos to, to Kyle Clark as, I think, media hero of the week. Uh, Representative Winholtz's remarks were reprehensible when somebody is criminally attacked, it's not appropriate to go out and say, well, they do other bad things, and so they sort of brought this on themselves. And her view that violence begets violence is a favorite of kindergarten teachers, but is not true. Uh, when the police used violence against the San Bernardino terrorists, it ended violence, it didn't cause more violence. And the same thing for the United States using violence against the National Socialist German Workers Party uh, from 1941 to 1945. That reduced violence in the long run, even though it used a lot of violence on the way. Planned Parenthood also shows us another example that I think more organizations should imitate, which is they hardened their target. Nobody in, inside Planned Parenthood was killed. They had a strong system of locks, cameras, things like that. And they had a security guard on the premises who uh, had left for the day, which shows that probably the, the criminal uh, was deterred by the presence of that armed guard. So I think more and more organizations and, and individuals, you, know, you don't have to go up to the Planned Parenthood level, but everybody can think about how is our office building, how is our house, what is defensible, where would we retreat to, just have those plans. Not, you know, you're not going to get attacked by ISIS aficionados or uh, nutcases like in Colorado Springs, for, that's very unlikely, but there's regular crime too. You know, what if somebody was just burglarizing your house and came in? What would you do? It's it's good for everybody to have that advanced planning. Eric, we, we kind of uh, already looked at, uh, or, or we already knew we were going to be looking at the local politics here. I was still stunned with how. Uh, it, it increased so dramatically, and I think there's going to be some ramifications here. I think there's going to be uh, the folks on. Uh, Folks plan it like uh, Representative Winholtz, and that don't immediately say, like what David just said, that the comments are reprehensible. I think there's, there can, I can see some fallout here. Colorado is a purple state. We don't like to be thrust one way or the other when it comes to spectrums, um, and especially in, in very tender times like this. What were some of your thoughts when you saw some of the local uh, response? Well, I think you said it well. It is a tender time, and we are a purple state. I think we could have a motion a second, and all five of us agree that uh, Representative Winholz is probably the disgrace of the week. When mm -hmm. it gets time to disgrace the week, <laughs> we can do our second choice, because she, you know, she, she, she just won the prize. 
totally reprehensible to steal David's word, totally tone deaf. You can be pro-life, as ardently pro-life as you want, and there is a time and a place and a sensitivity that is required, and she missed all of, uh, all of those memos. We talked in the first round about how everyone runs to their corners. Well, that's what we saw in terms of uh, local politics as well. And it, it rings a bit hollow to me when you have pro-choice activists or Progress Now or whatever using an incident like this to try to talk for calm rhetoric on the side of their opponents. Or when you have pro-life activists trying to use an incident like this to advance their case. The First Amendment in this country, the importance of the First Amendment is to protect unpopular speech. Uh, you get my respect when you advocate for speech with which you disagree it doesn't do as much for me when you try to use the megaphone to try to tamp down speech which with, with which you disagree. I think you get my point. Mm -hmm. So all of that sort of washed over me in some of those press conferences, particularly the Progress Now one, uh, where some of her rhetoric about war on women and whatever was also ill thought through. Right, I, I get your point. Using your bull, the, the right to your bullhorn to say that person's bullhorn should be taken away. Exactly. I get it. Uh, Lisa, your thoughts on this when it comes down to the the local situation? Well, I think one of the things that was interesting is just that you know, I, I, I'm a one for discipline. So I liked you know what Kyle Clark did was just like you know, th and when I was listening to NPR and Dina Temple rap. So this is the sort of broad part of it, which is and Dina Temple Ross was I clearly putting the brakes on sort of making, um, going beyond, you know, speculate. She just wasn't going to speculate, and I really appreciated that. I think that that serves the community really well. And so one of the things that was really interesting um, about the social media thing was just like, it looks like private speech, but it's so clearly not. And in a way that that's, that is one of those things that I just, I mean, on a way, in a certain way, I guess I appreciate how hideous her comments were because it reminds you how bad our situation is in some ways in terms of like what ideologically we're sort of where we're at at things and I and, and similarly I'm incredibly disappointed in some ways strategically and what sort of progress now was doing because I'm just like that's tone deaf too I mean that it's it's not as hideous potentially mm -hmm. but only because I'm it, that's you know well on some levels because it really isn't as hideous but the other part of it is that that's probably closer to my you know line to my politics to some degree but I really I, I think one of the things I like about Colorado is I actually um, still kind of trust that even when these things happen, that the Colorado, Colorado I know and believe in is purple, is smart, and does know how to read c culture and like nuttiness better than some other places. Um, but it was a rough week. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a rough week. That's an excellent way to put it. Patty, wrap it up for us. Well, let's talk about Colorado, the purple, but it, it's a mix of the colors and the fact that there are people who are willing to listen to each other, and I hope that's what we do. I mean, you even have Governor Hickenlooper saying, people are talking about guns. I don't know the answer right now. People are looking for answers, and let's hope they're willing to listen. The extraordinary story down in Colorado Springs, you have definitely a nut who needed some mental health, anti-abortion. He goes and shoots up the place. You have the lovely, lovely police officer who gave his life, who was also anti-abortion, but died fighting mm -hmm. for the rights of people. Uh, there is a unity rally tomorrow for Planned Parenthood, which is great. There's a uni there was a unity rally last night at the local mosque because we have to at least start talking to each other and be willing to listen to each other instead of go into our corners. The Colorado Supreme Court refused to hear Governor Hickenlooper's petition questioning Attorney General Cynthia Kaufman's lawsuit against the Clean Power Act. The, the, the court denied the request, citing a 2003 case stating that courts are not to chime in on issues when, when, when on, is, on these issues when an adequate alternative remedy exists. Um, Eric, even though David is our esteemed attorney at the table, I'm going to start with you. Um, this fight isn't over. This is just the first round of the base of the Supreme Court saying it's not our fight yet go through the proper channels. Um, do you think Governor Hickenlooper really amps this up and wants to fight this fight for as long as it takes? Well, let me first clarify I, that I'm not an attorney at this table. It's, I hope it's not that I'm not esteemed. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. Uh, uh, this was an interesting development yesterday. 
uh, and probably a significant setback for the governor, given that this has become quite the battle royale between the governor and Attorney General uh, Kaufman. To be clear, the court did not rule on the merits. The court just said, take it up through the, the normal channels, started at the, presumably at the district court level, and we'll hear the case when it gets to us in a timely way. So there was no ruling on the merits, but yet I think the governor had you know, picked this fight, well, both of them picked the fight, but, um, and uh, was hoping for an adjudication and a quick adjudication. In situations like this, I do what I call the rule of substitution. I think everyone is cheering for one side or the other based not on governance and whose mm -hmm. responsibility this should be to represent the state in legal proceedings, but based on what they think about climate change and the, the clean power plan that is at the heart of this. And if the situation was reversed and you had a Republican governor and a Democratic attorney general, which is quite possible in purple Colorado at some point in the future, that situation will exist, would the same people be cheering for the same sides? My gut tells me probably not. And what interests me about this issue is the governance point of view of really does that responsibility rest with the governor as the chief executive or does it rest with the attorney general as the chief law enforcement officer? That's what the courts have to, to, to figure out. Lisa, what do you think of the development this week? Yeah, I, will, I, I appreciate it and what a great trick to like flip them around because it does sort of clarify things for you in some ways, which is I, I appreciated uh, that the Supreme Court said don't, you don't start with us, you go back down. I mean, I thought that that seemed like the kind of governance that I want from a Supreme Court, you know? <laughs> and, and the state is to say, okay, you can't just leap to us, even though, that, I mean, so that was the thing that I took, that was my takeaway, um, and I was intrigued by it, so. Patty, uh, does Governor Hickler have, I guess, the, the, the motivation to, to make this a district court fight, an appellate court fight, and get on the Supreme Court? Is, is that a fight that he should be fighting? Sure. I mean, he wants to find out if this is something that the AG can do. It would be nice to get a definitive decision. And the Supreme Court was right not to take it on. It goes to district court. This is not the only fight we're going to see, obviously, about the environment. This is about law. But the Oil and Gas Commission that was set up is having trouble coming to agreements. We're going to be seeing ballot measures coming down in 2016. So this is going to be another ugly year of shouting over the environment. David, you're the, our esteemed lawyer at the table. Your thoughts? <laughs> uh, for Eric's point about flip-floppery, uh, the king of that is Ken Salazar, our former state attorney general, who beat Governor, Republican Governor Bill Owens in the Colorado Supreme Court on this issue and has now flip-flopped, and he, he agrees with, with what he hopes will be his predecessor uh, as, as Democratic governor of Colorado, Governor Hickenlooper. Structurally, our Constitution separates the Attorney General from the Governor. They are both independently elected by the people, just like the Denver City Auditor is separately elected from the Mayor. That's part of the checks and balances of our constitutional system. The Attorney General is responsible to the people. We rejected the New Jersey-style model where the Attorney General is an appointee of the Governor. Well, it's time for our favorite part of the show, and one that we've been off for two weeks. I'm sure that it's been stacked up. I know, Lisa, you're new, but don't, don't worry. It comes pretty naturally. <laughs> Disgrace of the Week, Patty, as always, you start us off. Well, there are plenty. And down in Colorado Springs, there's another episode which deals with watch out for social media, watch out for hate speech, what, is t what goes too far. Several Colorado College students have gotten in trouble, in fact, expelled for posts they put on Yik Yak. Um, they're ugly, they're racist, but the response has been tough, too. So it's not been a good month in Colorado Springs. David, your disgrace of the week. Mosul, Iraq, one of the largest cities in the Middle East and now an ISIS, the ISIS stronghold. Until that changes, nothing, all these other things we're talking about aren't going to change. ISIL uh, may be painted in the city of Mosul, but it has the ability to, pro to project force globally, including by helping self, uh, people getting su sudden jihad syndrome and, uh, and being self-starters. Uh, that wasn't the situation that President Obama inherited in 2009, and the catastrophe of his failed foreign policy allowing ISIS to take over will be causing us trouble for a very long time to come. Eric. Ditto to both of those, particularly to Patty's. It's sad to see my alma mater, Colorado College, sort of heading down this road with so many other elite institutions. But I want to, even though there are plenty of local disgraces, I'm going to go to Chicago. Mayor Rahm Emanuel 
sitting on that video for, what, 15 months, clearly sitting on it to get through a difficult re-election on his part. Now he's cashiering his lieutenants, starting with his hand-picked police chief. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how he survives this. It's going to be interesting to see how prominent national Democrats with whom he's closely aligned, including people with last names like Obama and Clinton, how long they're able to maintain their silence on this. It stinks. Mm -hmm. Lisa. I will not, if I come back, which I hope to, yes, I, will not, will. Uh, I will not beg, I will not use Thanksgiving as a reason for me not having a disgrace <laughs> beyond, um, beyond um, the Commerce City woman its comments, um, but uh, I am a little bit of a Pollyanna, so I'm going to have to look harder for a... <laughs> a dire optimist is probably pretty welcome at this table. We'll take it. It, it won't take us very long to make you cynical, don't worry. Oh, good, all right. uh, say something nice about somebody, Patty. I'm going to say two. This is how Pollyanna I am. One, <laughs> thank you, Mother Nature. It's going to be a nice night. Get out there, Denver, and at least enjoy some community at the mm. Parade of Lights. Yeah. And I want to also say congratulations to my father, who just turned 90, and we had a big Calhoun Palooza over his birthday yeah. in, back in Chicago. Here, here, there, it, it's it's tough to be uh, the, the coolest Calhoun when you're involved, but he's pretty dang close to pretty, the coolest oh, he's Calhoun. The coolest. <laughs> David. The Broncos with their their Brock of Gibraltar, the the Brockweiler, <laughs> leading them to victory over the Patriots. <laughs> Just the puns we're going to get from his first name is going to be worth everything, Eric. Well, congratulations to Mr. Calhoun. Uh, that's a great one. Let me talk about the first responders in in all of these incidents we've seen. Uh, and particularly here at home in Colorado Springs where it was a very professional response. But also, I don't know if anyone was watching TV last night, Thursday night, the press conference out of San Bernardino where they turned the mic over to one of the first responders, uh, uh, Officer Mike Madden of the San Bernardino Police Department, and he gave sort of a blow-by-blow -blow of their immediate entry into their bu that building. Police officers have had a hard few years, and a lot of that criticism has been deserved, as this officer Madden indicated. But most police officers, he estimated it at 99.5 percent. I'm not going to quibble about decimal points or exact stats. Most police officers and first responders are honorable people doing a very tough job. We saw it this week. Here, Lisa. And this is sort of complicated because it might go to disgrace, which is how these people, <laughs> but also to uh, to a shout out, which is I was talking to a friend this morning who had lost her mother, who just turned 90, in D.C. And she listed every human being um, that helped her in this sort of hospice situation, and it was just like that sort of multi, you know, multi-ethnic, multi the mm -hmm. things that make us, I think, uh, it certainly make me very proud and um, and touched to be an American, and I felt like. I saw that also in the pictures of who we lost mm -hmm. as a nation last week in the mass shootings. And I was just like, that's, that's our America. That's, mm -hmm. you know, these are our offices. This is what our, we look like more and more. And so there's a way in which I think that's absolutely beautiful. And I also find it very painful um, after this past week, but mostly also really beautiful that these are who, what, what makes us now. Well said, Americans. well said. That's all the time we have tonight. Thanks for tuning in. Remember that Tuesday, December 8th is Colorado Gives Day. Make a big impact by supporting Colorado Public Television with a donation of your choice that will be matched with a grant for up to $10,000 by Newman's Own Foundation. Visit cpt12.org to schedule your donation today. For everyone here at Channel 12, I'm Dominic Dizzuti. Thanks very much for watching. Good night. Hi, I'm Ken, and I am one of the camera operators for the uh, Colorado Inside Out show. There's a reason that I'm behind the camera most of the time, yeah. all the time, because I'm too damn pretty to be in front of it. We run four cameras on the show, 
uh, three cameras on tripods, one on a jib. The cameras that we use for CIO, or Colorado Inside Out, are pretty standard cameras. The viewfinder is black and white, which helps with uh, focusing. There's a zoom control and a focus control. So all the camera operator has to do is aim the camera, focus it, and zoom to the appropriate shot. This is the jib. What the jib allows us to do is to move the camera up and down or back and forth very smoothly. Makes for a nice uh, opening and closing shot. And we also use it for uh, wide shots, transition shots in between the uh, close-ups of the guests on the show. We can uh, pan and tilt as the camera goes up and down. We can get really high shots, we can get really low shots, and everything in between. This is an LCD monitor for the jib camera. Um, it allows the jib operator to be able to see what they're uh, pointing the camera at and to focus and compose the shot and everything else. It's uh, basically the equivalent of the viewfinder on the other cameras. Right now what's going on is the cameras are being chipped. That consists of all the cameras aimed at the chip chart, which has all of the different uh, shades of gray from black to white and uh, the different colors. The chip chart is lit with our typical lighting that we're going to use on the show. And basically what is going on right now is the engineer is adjusting all the cameras so that they match. I'm getting a, a close-up of uh, Gabrielle there and then a medium shot, as you can tell, if you so wish, uh, so that Ryan in the booth can adjust the lights to make her uh, look pretty, which she does naturally, so it's not very difficult. You get to listen to the headphones of all the jokes that they are saying in the room. Um, trying That's pretty to, fun. Yeah, trying to decipher whether they're calling out cues to you or they're just making <laughs> jokes. <laughs> ciao, ciao, everyone. CIO Friday. Great stuff. Move, move around. Make sure you move around yeah. so everybody knows it's handheld. That's it. I'm done. Welcome to the December 4th, 2015 edition of Colorado Inside Out Post Game, a special web exclusive production here on Channel 12. Let's get a quick take on the Denver City Council rejecting a preservation bid on a West Highland house on Monday. The contentious 8 to 4 vote is the second of its kind in two weeks and has upset some members of the local community due to concerns of, quote, out of scale development and eliminating historical landmarks. Patty Calhoun from Westward, uh, you, uh, you know Highlands very well, uh, you know this argument very well. We had a you know, big city council election earlier this year. Maybe some people were paying attention, maybe not. But now we're seeing some of it really come down to the decisions that now people are paying attention to. Were you surprised by the result of this vote? I was actually surprised because it was the right decision. We have to remember these weren't historical buildings. They didn't have designation. They were just buildings that maybe if you looked at them could have been designated historic. I live in a designated historic building and I have to say there are stringent rules about it. What you do, you, they can't be knocked down if they've been designated by Denver unless they did one block in my house where they revert, about well, one uh, house on my block which they reversed. But in this case, I think they made the right decisions. The, it wasn't the landowners, it wasn't the property owners who wanted to designate them as historic. It was neighbors who were upset because they didn't want the construction 
that is going to be put on those lots that is allowed under our zoning. So if we've got concerns about zoning, we should go fight our zoning. If we've got some concerns that certain buildings should be historic, we should go try to get them on the register now. We shouldn't be fighting when a property owner wants to do what's legal. David Kopel from the Impence Institute and DU Law School. Do you think this will spur, I mean, we have some folks that at least campaigned as, I don't want to say anti-development, but they were certainly, there was a lot of that kind of rhetoric during the election. Do you think this kind of reform is on its way or more of the same? Well, I think Patty was exactly right that whatever people think about zoning issues, the proper way to do that is to have the city council vote on zoning issues and that historic preservation, which is a good idea conceptually is so often abused uh, with involuntary designations for buildings that are not historic except you know in the sense that well it's it used to be that's the kind of thing that got built around this area is sort of like very normal housing. You know, we're, we're not talking about the Molly Brown house or, or something with, with intrinsic value. And I, I think that that's a real abuse. It happens all the time in Boulder. Uh, again, just as, as a pretext uh, by the Gladys Kravitz neighborhood crowd uh, to oppress other people uh, illegitimately. Eric Sonnen, political analyst. I, you know, I agree with what uh, uh, Patty and David had said, but I also understand um, what folks are going through in some of these neighborhoods. I used to live in Highlands. My grandparents lived in the Highlands. I'm familiar with the area. And I know what it feels like to walk down a block you've known for years and a bungalow that maybe Molly Brown or anyone of the other famous never lived in, but that suddenly is now a, uh, a, a square structure that looks like it does not belong anywhere near the neighborhood that goes all the way to the sidewalks. That still seems like like a problem, but this doesn't seem like the right way to solve it. Do you think there's going to be more impetus to try to solve that problem? Well, maybe so, but it ought to be solved through the right channels. I mean, I'd love to have a different take here just to mix it up, but I don't <laughs> have a different take here. Here to what both uh, Patty and, 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 and David had to say, uh, I'm in agreement. David used the word pretext uh, for a lot of these historic uh, applications. I would use the word ruse. Uh, I mean, this is not about the historic property. It is, uh, which are very average, typical properties. Um, I think Patty, references that she lives in what is uh, actually a historically designated building. I assume that's because Patty lives there. Absolutely. It's the, Mo <laughs> it's the Molly Brown house, it's the Patty Calhoun house. But, uh, but be that as it may, if we want to have these discussions, great, let's have these discussions. But let's do it through a zoning process or through a master planning process or what have you, not by random, hostile, historic designation applications that seems to me to be uh, completely out of proportion and I'm, I'm glad the council voted as it did. I was sad to see four members of council buy into this notion. Multimedia journalist Lisa Kennedy joins us the first on the table. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, so, I mean, the Highlands is not, our, uh, is not Denver's only uh, neighborhood full of uh, houses that are older and then suddenly turn into uh, something completely different. Do you think there will be other motivation to get some zoning rules changed or uh, it, the, the council acted appropriately and not much more changes coming our way? I think that the council, I mean, I think that all of us seem to be somewhat in agreement, which is I think the council, council acted appropriately. This is my neighborhood. I get it. I get, but I think that strategically you have to, like, do big picture stuff sometimes. And the big picture stuff is, you know, is not necessarily emotional and requires a lot more work, which is to, like, have a vision for the city, especially in this sort of booming moment that... I think sort of balances as many, you know, sort of needs as possible in terms of what we think of as like representing Denver and like what is like historic and what gets lost. I mean, we're, you know, your studios are in a neighborhood that is, you know, I said once and I think it was sort of not appropriate in some way because it didn't recognize people's, you know, lives on the ground, which is to say I was sort of appreciative of the recession putting the taps on um, development and five points mm -hmm. because I think it did. And now that it's gone, things are really booming again. And you look here and there, and I, and I love that the neighborhood went, the West Highlands neighborhood went from R2 to R1, because I do think that it is precisely the kind of thing. And that is a little bit more about strategy and saying, we really do want to preserve this, as opposed to like sort of pitting neighbor against neighbor right. and sort of, and property owner against other property owners. It's like, that gets so, it gets so riven so quickly in a way. And I think, and I understand the sort of exhaustion and like you sort of come up from downtown into the highlands, you are gonna be like, 
<laughs> can't we stop even one thing? But to, the notion that the one thing is like someone's, you know, property, and it is a little bit like, you know, a cheat to sort of say this is. I love the idea that you, you know, if it's historic, it was historic before the like the battle. So make make that your effort. I think that that's really appropriate. But I, I get the emotional part of it, and you know. Um, Rafael Espinosa was, I mean, he won by a very interesting landslide. It was a rebuke to some degree of the sense of what was going on in, in the highlands. And uh, so I expect, but I expect better. I expect better of the council members to like really not just pick up their, pick their battles, but teach their constituency how to pick a battle. If that's your battle, then like start doing the work. You know, that's like start doing it across the city, honestly. It's like, oh, this is something that uh, different communities feel. Are there other ways to build alliances that really do sort of say, well, we don't want everything to be a box? Because if you look at it, you're like going, I guess it can't fall down in the next 50 years when I'm like going curses. Why does that, why is that so ugly? Right. Yeah. yeah. That is all the time we have for Color Insight Postgame this week. Leave us a comment. Tell us what you think. For everyone here at CPT12.org,